Welcome to the NEPA Scene Podcast, the only local live streaming <laughs> podcast of its kind. We're coming to you from the Accelerator Building in downtown Wilkes-Barre. I'm Rich Howells. I'm the founder and editor of NEPA Scene. And tonight, we're here with indie filmmakers Rory Carlarossi and uh, Matthew Weiss of Ravenview Productions in Scranton. Scranton. All right. Uh, before their film, The Burden of Beauty, debuts at Three Jacks Burger Bar in Dunmore on Wednesday, August 17th, we're going to talk about their uh, history and love of cinema, uh, how they met and started Ravenview, the writing and inspiration behind uh, this new short film, uh, casting at every step of the production process over the last few years, their roles as director and director of photography, uh, the funding and technology behind modern filmmaking, the uh, mysterious trailer that you may have just watched, or you can watch at the end of the show, and much, much more. So uh, please stay tuned for the full hour. We would love to hear from you guys down in the comments below. So if you guys are uh, either film geeks or you absolutely know nothing about film, but you have an interest in it, uh, we want to hear from everybody. So uh, leave those comments down below. We'll get to them uh, in just a bit. And... Uh, if uh, it, th this is a kind of an interesting one for me, uh, Rory and I kind of go back many years, and we haven't seen each other in like I don't know, like near a decade, maybe About somewhere that. around that area. So like, and then we ran into each other like twice, and like <laughs> within a, short span, yeah, within like a week or two, which was was crazy. So I guess I, I took that as a sign that we should kind of get together, especially because for years you'd always talked about making movies, and now it's finally happening. So. Uh, you know, I kind of want to do that. So, you know, rather than getting a coffee or a beer like normal people would do, <laughs> uh, we're just going to live stream that conversation. Yeah. yeah. As, you, as interesting or as awkward as it is, <laughs> however it's going to come out, you, you, it's for your entertainment. So it will be awkward. That's, uh, that's modern media for you. <laughs> So, but we hope you enjoy it. And uh, before we dive in, I just want to thank our sponsor, uh, Special Guest, who's provided us with this uh, great office space. Uh, the uh, equipment that these guys were admiring beforehand that I could never afford on my own, uh -huh. and the funds to make this podcast and our website possible. Uh, Special Guest is a talent booking uh -huh. marketplace, making it easier for talented people to get discovered and booked. It was founded in 2017 by actor comedian Damon Wayans Jr along with uh, local entrepreneur Chris Jones. You can check them out at specialguestapp.com or download their app on iTunes or Google Play. They also just launched merch, merchbooth.com, a uh, free program to help artists and talent professionals create and sell merch online and in person at shows. Uh, many local musicians are using it right now. Uh, NEPA Scene is also using it as well. Um, so you can go and sign up for merchbooth.com and get your own uh, online marketplace to uh, sell t-shirts, hoodies, all that kind of stuff. They're all printed locally at Axelrad in Wilkes-Barre. Uh, we just got our new shirts and hoodies in and a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll be showing you those maybe maybe next episode or something. We'll, we'll, we'll dive more into that. Uh, Parlor Beverages has also provided us with the best fucking root beer out there now. They have root beer, birch beer, and butterscotch, and you can get these at uh, a lot of local grocery stores like uh, Garrity's as well as online. So if you want it shipped directly to you, you can visit drinkparlor.com. Use promo code NEPACene for 10% off. Now, you said you'd, uh, you'd tried it before, Matt? Yeah, and uh, that's why I had to open this one first. Uh, the <laughs> butterscotch uh, root beer. We debuted our trailer for The Burden of Beauty at the NEP Horror Fest recently at the Circle Drive-In, and... You know, there's a lot of vendors, booths, musicians, and stuff there. And I just happened to look over, and I saw this, and I wasn't sure if it was alcoholic or not, but yeah. I saw butterscotch root beer, and I tell you, I'm sold. Like, if I only drank this root beer for the rest of my life, I would be okay with that. So thank you, Parlor, for making a really good <laughs> root beer. I'll drink soda, so I'm kind of boring. Oh, all right, that's all right. Well, I mean, you could you, you feel free to try one if you want. I'm and they're there, a poser. they're there to Just tempt you, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Do Open it with your teeth. You know, I don't know. <laughs> all right, so uh, I, we'll start at the very beginning. What were uh, some of the movies that you guys grew up on? So, <laughs> you know, I used to get picked on as a kid for it, but now I, like, embrace it. Like, I'm a huge fan of, like, the classic blockbuster i grew up with like et jurassic park jaws the rocketeer um even like animated things like the iron giant like i just really there was like a um close encounters like stuff like that i don't know there was just really 
uh, the spectacle for me was it was really fun and stuff like that. I never really got into horror or anything. That was like my brother who like torment me and show me like Slumber Party Massacre or something, um, or like Night of the Demons. That kind of weirded me out at some point with the lipstick. We're not even going to get in there right now, but that freaked me out a little bit. Uh, no, but I like I I like a real polished looking film, but I also like a film that has character. So it's a really weird uh, blending of styles, and I think that as I I grew up as, as a, a like a shut in kind of um, like probably most of us that <laughs> do creative things, um, you know, film was like a, a a mother, a brother, a best friend, a babysitter, you know. So I just kind of like just fell in love with that whole medium, and um, I just was really drawn to like just a lot of uh, the visuals in it. I found out as as time went on because I thought, oh, I just want to make a film like anybody else, but it yeah. really was that whole like uh, just I was chasing the image, I think, and now I get to chase that dream every day trying to capture every frame the way that hopefully i can get to i don't know yeah I'm how, on that how about you what did you grow up on um <clears throat> my gateway drug into movies was horror movies mm. which you and i have had many long conversations <laughs> of course about horror films i um, got to many conventions for <laughs> we went to a few conventions together and it was lots of fun um yeah i i was always drawn to the creativity and, and horror, because I think it's just like everything about it's so iconic. You know what I mean? Like all the uh, the masks, different faces. Like it, it's like you just see them on T-shirts every single day. You know what I mean? You can go to right. church and there's a guy wearing like a Freddy Krueger shirt. I mean, it's at the point where if somebody wears a hockey mask, they think Jason. Yeah. They don't think hockey. Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's how iconic it gets, you know? And it, and it kind of <clears throat> kind of blew my mind when I was a kid, because my grandmother... She gave me, um, do you remember those old, like, 8 millimeter projectors? Yeah, yeah. She she just was like, I don't want this stuff anymore. Take it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I remember there was uh, Godzilla versus what was titled Godzilla vs. The Thing, which was like mm. Mothra. But um, I had this projector, and I could just, like, put the movie on the wall. And I was just, like, loading up the little reel and just being like, this is so cool. Like, mm-hmm. I was just, like, obsessed with being able to just, like, feed the film and then watch it on a wall and bore my friends with it because they had no interest because we were like 90s kids you know that right, everything was yeah. like colorful and it's like hey kid do you like loud noises and <laughs> and for like there was, it was silent it was black and white and they were sleeping but yeah. i was like enamored with it but um it was cool because horror um what's neat about it is that a lot of the filmmakers at that time like like a john carpenter or like a like a Wes craven even george romero um they were all inspired by these other type of filmmakers, you right. know? And, and you start spider webbing, you know? You're just like, oh, like, who does John Carpenter like? And then you go into, like, an Alfred Hitchcock, and that was, like, a big game changer for me because I was, like, just... And still am obsessed with his movies because they're, like, completely visual, you know? Like, right. it's like you could turn the volume down on those movies and you'll still know what's going on. Like, it's just amazing. And, and some of it kind of falls into what I do. Like, I'm always just kind of like, use the camera not just to film action, but to also tell the story. And it's like, kind of like a rule. But we talked about that a lot more filming. I was like, I need to know what's happening even if the characters aren't talking, you know? Right. So, you know, from, you know, like Hitchcock, you start kind of exploring his influences. And then, um, like, Martin Scorsese was obsessed with Hitchcock also. So it's like it all just kind of goes outward. And then right. Hitchcock brings you to, like, Fellini and... Um, I just became like a massive film nerd and uh, spent many Friday nights by myself watching <laughs> Star Wars, <laughs> Star Wars trilogy, Star Wars, I, the VHS. I think I wore yeah. that thing out as a kid before they were altered. <laughs> Star Wars. I, I wish that movie took off. You yeah, know? I know. It's, it's a shame. That little that. thing. It's yeah. a shame yeah. that it uh, never really took off. But I you know it was weird when I was coming in here um, when you were going to do your thing. I was going to uh, cap it off with. Um, watch Rich Howells and I do our best not to just talk about Star Wars the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happens a lot on this show. Yeah. <laughs> was, as soon as we, I meet a fellow Star Wars guy, I'm like, oh God, I'm just going to fight the temptation and not just make this <laughs> an entire Star Wars thing. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if I'm even if I'm filming or something, you're like, dude, I need someone on the show to talk about Star Wars. I'm there. <laughs> I feel like I've been plugging this like all week with everyone I talk to, like that light and magic thing on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, I, can't, I, I, I haven't seen it yet. I can't wait to sit down and watch that. <laughs> Though. It's such a good forward insight to, that. to it, yeah. And that's like another journey to how I even got into all different things with film anyway, mm-hmm. uh, is uh, I just, 
I never had money for a camera. I never had a camera. I don't even use one until I was like in my 20s. But um, I don't know why I was looking at film scores, but I was just like going through Google and I'm like, well, a good film or a film has to have a good score. Like sound is everything. So I'm like looking at how to do that. And I stumbled across uh, like videocopilot.net or whatever and saw that you can uh, make an explosion in the computer and all this other <laughs> stuff like that. And so my journey into film was like, uh, pirating After Effects and like learning how, <laughs> how that worked to create explosions. Please don't sue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, you know, obviously we, we're legit now. We pay for everything. But, you know, when you're, you know, 20 years old, no money and nothing. But that's how right. it started for me. So I, and I always loved Star Wars and all that stuff as a kid and, um, and that whole like journey of ILM. So I just really liked effects and I thought that was going to be the route that I went. But um, all it did was help me be more well-rounded and you know, understanding like what, like more of a tech side thing, but, um, yeah, I went from VFX into a uh, cinematographer, but it, it, now it's fun. And, um, I think he just has like a love of film in general, like where I wish that I had like mm. all film, like, the, I mean, I respect a lot of films and I like a lot of films, but he's definitely like a psychopath with it, but I do <laughs> have to saying say, I don't go outside. Yeah. Much. Right. But yeah, I do yeah. have to say the reason why I have such a broad love of different films, even black and white and everything else like that is, uh, from being a kid and sitting with my great grandmother on her couch, and she came from Italy, fresh off the boat, and she would watch Turner Classics all the time, like singing in the rain, Casablanca. But she made that whole time of Hollywood seem just so magical, like it was that whole golden era. So right. I don't know. She put some kind of crazy, like excitement charm to it. And ever since then, it's like all of that stuff from uh, being such a little kid and hearing her and everything. I just there was nothing else I was gonna do, uh, but chase this dream for now seems like oh well over 10 years 12 years i don't even know how long i've been chasing this thing trying to make it happen can i tell you an embarrassing story absolutely <clears throat> right out of the gate uh, want to hear about the first time i made a movie mm. <clears throat> i was about 13 years old and my sister kayla and i we had a, a friend dennis and we used to just drive around and just go to those weird video stores that used to exist <laughs> that were not like chains right and they would have like weird independent movies that mm -hmm. no one's ever heard of and no one's heard of since. Right. And that, that curtain in the back room somewhere. Well, yeah, that was a, that's a <laughs> you didn't go back there, right? That was not the kind no of Dallas, film that no we... No Dallas, no yeah. nothing. <laughs> but we, um, I remember we were just like scouring the shelves, just like looking for something. And uh, I remember I found this low budget zombie vampire movie. I don't know what it was, but I remember being Zompire. very charmed by it because it was so low budget and it looked so terrible that I was like, I could do that. Mm. You know what I mean? It's just like, right. oh, it's, oh, it's all right. It's kind of <laughs> like when you hear like, uh, like when you see Evil Dead for the first time and you're like, not talking down Evil Dead by the way. Sure, of um, course But not. that whole like low budget quality where you're like, this seems accessible. Like yeah. Clerks, you know? Right. Um, but I remember um, after the movie was over, uh, my sister's just like, she's like, oh, how'd you like it? And I'm like, oh, it was Honestly, it was, it was pretty bad, but I, but I, but I kind of loved it. Yeah. And like, I think, I, you know, I think I could probably make a movie and her, like our friend was just like, he's like, oh, dude's like, I have a camera. We can do that. And I'm like, you have a fucking camera? <laughs> like, I got, I'm like, you have a camera? Bring that to my house. So I just like called up all my friends and I'm like, yo, we're going to like film a movie on Saturday. They're like, great. What's it about? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, what's it called? I'm like, couldn't tell you. <laughs> like, so who are the characters? I'm like, guys and girls just show up. Um, so like we did and we we're filming and it was such an important experience for me because I remember we were like, you know, putting everybody in front of the camera and everyone was terrified to act. Of course. You know? So I jumped in and I was like like a ham about it. I'm like, ah, it's <laughs> filming. I need to be on camera. Um, but I remember just thinking in my head, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to watch this and I'm going to have a movie. It's going to be so cool. And we watched it afterwards and I'm like, this, this is so bad. Like it was so <laughs> terrible because I'm like, I can't hear anything. And like the, 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 the lighting's terrible. Is this the VCR editing? Yeah, like? it was like me putting VCR together. I'm like, this is going to be so cool. And I edit this and it's like one long <laughs> space of like yeah. static. I'm like, oh, there we are again. Um, and just that was like a moment where I was like, oh, as a child, you know, being sure. like, oh, so like sounds important, <laughs> cinematography is important, acting's important, me being behind the camera is important, <laughs> you know, because I mean, in the front of it was not making anybody all that uh, excited. But um, yeah, that was like uh, an interesting little experience, but it also crushed me a little bit on the inside, but we should move on. <laughs> <laughs> so you've carried that with you. Yeah, first was... time I've, I've talked about it, it's like my therapy, you know. <laughs> That's why we have the couch here. Yeah, that's why we have a different kind of 
birch beer for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we charge by the hour. So. Oh, I see. Um, but Bill hey, the root beer is free. So, oh, good, you know, good. That's, <laughs> that's The things that you can't have or won't have are free. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously it didn't totally crush your idea of wanting to make a movie at some point. And I know like the whole time that, that, that we knew each other, uh, you were always talking about writing specifically. Yeah. And so were you always kind of writing ideas for scripts? Like, uh, were you working on something like this at, at some point? Or? To kind of explain when you were saying we kind of lost touch for 10 years, yeah, this yeah. is the gap. Right. This is what happened. Okay. The missing yeah, this piece is of what film. I want to know. About. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got to a point where I was, like, going out with people all the time, talking, talking about doing things, and that is a trap. So, like, anybody at home listening to this who wants to make a movie or record an album, don't talk about it. Just go do it, you know? And I knew, like, for myself, um, even back when I was doing that terrible film, um, that I knew I needed to do this. I just didn't know where I belonged in it. And to kind of answer your question of what you were saying before, like, it didn't quite crush me to the point that I wanted to stop. If anything, it kind of energized me to keep making better movies and trying, 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 trying. Mm -hmm. But after a while, it got to the point where I was like, what do you want to do in this whole thing? And the answer is always like right in front of you. You know, I was like, I love story. Like I love film, like it, because I love telling stories. I love writing scripts. I love developing characters. So for 10 years or so, <laughs> I uh, became a little bit more of a recluse. Um, I just started buying up books on screenwriting. Um, I started just watching videos on like structure. I just started watching everything like like foreign films silent films everything that was going on at the time in, in movies um everything from the past just everything trying to learn it like being like a like a sponge really <laughs> and i just like kept writing all these drafts being like this is great but it's 160 pages so i did something wrong <laughs> and then like you know after a while you start learning the structure and then you're like great i know how to structure a film now I need to know how to break the rules so that it's not boring. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So it's like you don't want to just do what you've seen. Yeah, yeah. So for like a while, it just really was that. Like I moved out to Los Angeles for a little bit. Um, and I went out there with the script. And I was uh, foolish enough at this point in my life to think I knew what I was doing. Because I actually got one of my scripts into the hands of a studio reader. Mm. And they were like, just say it in a nice way they're like oh like there's a really good story here but it's like looking at it without your glasses on because it's basically saying like it just needs to focus a little bit okay. um to me at that point i thought it was awesome and i knew what i was doing <laughs> so when i heard that it's just kind of like hard cut me in the shower like <laughs> uh, oh my god it's over um but then i just you know that was another one of those moments where i was like okay i know i love this because um i just got up the next day and i'm like okay try harder just keep writing and keep writing and find you know take you know get the glasses on slowly <laughs> and then eventually you know everything started to feel right and it started to feel like a movie but there, yeah there was a long period of time where I was just trying to get my hands um, around the, the the craft really mm. isn't that funny how it starts though because like when, when I met him was like I don't know 2000 Eight, late seven, eight, I, I, something like that. When we were projectionists. When we were projectionists <laughs> at a movie theater. Oh, um, so that's how you guys met. And, oh, yeah. Uh, it, back then, you Off think with film. <laughs> you think that you are the film crew. Like you literally <laughs> think that you, nobody knows what's best for your story or idea than you. And it's it's funny though because it really does come down to collaboration and that person giving you the the feedback, the notes, and telling you to focus. It's like. You know, that is good constructive criticism. Like, back, if, if we tried to make this film, I don't know, 10 years ago, oh, we'd, we would just hate each other and never get it made. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, we're very humble people. The way that we run Ravenview is, like, there's no egos. Like, we, if, if, we want to work with tons of local uh, filmmakers and stuff, but if someone comes in with an ego, we're just, it's like, sorry, buddy. Like, right. we'll see you next time. <laughs> it's like a weird poison, you know? Like, it just starts to rot it from the inside. And that's, when the, with, in this business, there's so many egos. So that's hard to avoid, really. But when we got done filming, and at some point, <clears throat> I'd love to talk this, this guy out, but um, our main actor in it, uh, Chris Alou, who is a phenomenal... Chris! <laughs> MVP. Um, I remember this was his first film, and he's done like a lot of stage work. He's done Broadway and like New York and stuff. He's like really, he's just insanely talented, but this is his first movie. And he came up to me and he's like, 
dude, he's like, this was like really fun. Or like, all film sets like this? I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> not, not even a little bit. Wait till you see that director who's just like in the corner drinking himself stupid because yeah. he's just like, oh, life's a burden. So are you. I just, I just feel very lucky, though, for this journey um, because the people we got to work with, speaking of Chris and uh, Melina and EJ and... Um, EJ, I felt like, was just that funny ghost friend that you hear about that I've never got to see for, like, <laughs> 10, 11 years or whatever. But, um, like, going back to the theater real quick, though, when I you know, when I met him, yeah, 2008, you know, that job, it felt like it was horrible, right, when you're young <laughs> like that. You think you know everything with film, but the job feels horrible. But that was, like, the best two years of my life. It was like we were 20 years old, running the theater, just three of us being able to managers yeah getting to watch movies <laughs> whatever judgment that was <laughs> who put you in charge yeah, yeah i was like we're like living, you know what we're living clerks <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, i mean yeah, we're yeah. just like <laughs> like mac go tell that customer to screw up yeah but i mean like we at least we cared about the quality of the picture okay i'm just pandering to what we're supposed to say but no it was fun though we'd watch films like after hours, we'd watch everything. You know, I, I, my first uh, introduction to editing was actually just cutting up the trailers because it was film back then, um, and pasting like clips from this trailer and this trailer together, and then uh, playing it to see what it would be like. Obviously, the sound was ass because like <laughs> it just goes from one whole total film oh. to a different. One. <laughs> yeah, so it wouldn't make any sense. But it was cool to to see that. Um, but that was like I think we needed that though. But we definitely couldn't have had this journey back then like we do now wow. and when um it had been so long and you know rory like he said he went his way uh to california i went my way to california and he spent his time writing i spent my time uh being an effects artist and senior editor for different post houses like doing different things uh been an editor for a long time um but then like you know i've ran my own business for a while too shooting commercials and stuff so just kind of like you know i really learned filmmaking from all of that um but I'm just happy that, like, out of nowhere, I was like, yeah, you know, we kind of had a falling out. Let me reach out to him. And I was just like, hey, what's going on? And, you know, what's new? You know, how are things? And he's just like, hey, I have a film. I want to make, make this film, Avengers Assemble, you know? And uh, That's literally what it said. Yeah, it's literally <laughs> what it said. And uh, so I was like, yeah, man, I want to make... It was like no, it's like no time had passed. It was like, yeah, let's meet. I went to Northern Light, typical, right? We went to a coffee shop. And uh, I read the script. And um, I just really just felt something when I read it because I've read a lot of my friends scripts a lot of, read a lot of scripts um over all these years but there's just something about Rory's writing and um I was called Mr. Criterion because <laughs> he just has <laughs> such a quality and such a co uh, connective tissue he likes to say with with his characters emotions story and what's going on there it's really clever really nicely done and I just really related it's crazy I related to each character in this story to some some level and I was just like, yeah, let's make it. And then the rest is history. Like, we haven't turned back since, and I wouldn't stop this train for anything, you know? And for the compliments, here's your sack of money. Oh, I'll take the sack of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has to pay me to say nice things about him, you know? No. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was interesting because it was really like, uh, you know, when you're trying to do something creative, it's not always the easiest thing mm -mm. to get off the ground, as you know. Sure. Um, but this is literally just like a moment where I'm like, I'm like, please, God, <laughs> just put me on the path. <laughs> it's hard because you give everything to this journey. And it's unfortunate. It's like sometimes you, you know, you lose out on like friends or relationships and stuff because you kind of just grow in that direction of something that you have to have. And I think that's the the best thing between Rory and I, which is like we just have such trust and respect for each other. It's such an organic partnership right now. It's because like he understands what this means to me without even having to say it like that weird just like kind of connection of what this journey means of what we're trying to do and you know the burden of beauty is awesome and i always keep telling them it's like i want everything to be about this film that we're talking about and enjoying it but it is a piece of a journey you know we we have a slate of projects and he's got clever script after clever script and they're all each one's bigger but um you know we want to get to a feature we want to get to you know doing these projects get bigger, bigger, up into getting a feature out there. And um, I don't know, I don't know how it works between us, but it's just like every part of the process, every time something breaks or every time something goes crazy, like we just, it's like, it's not even osmosis. We don't have to be next to each other or anything, but it's like we just know what each other's saying without having to say anything. And it's, I, I don't know how that's happening. It was funny because there was great. a moment we were like setting up some shots and uh, it was when we were filming the second scene. And I remember we had to get our wide, you know? And uh, 
Matt's, Matt's just like, so what, like, where do you want the camera? And I'm just like, well, he's like, how about here? I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to do. So, so, yeah, <laughs> like, we had a lot of moments like that where it's just kind of like, okay, so I see this in my head. And really, like, sometimes even just getting a shot out of your head takes a little bit of a, like communication with somebody where you're like, yeah, maybe a little bit to the lab. Maybe, but <laughs> I just feel like, so this is the shot list, and we would talk about it. And then he would just put the camera down, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> no, but it's good, good. To, it's good to have each other because I think, I mean, you, we're running the whole show ourselves. And some of the best things is like, I'll see something, I'm like hats. freaking out. And they're like, look at the monitor, like, oh, I hope so. And then he'll like jump in and catch something. And then uh, same with, uh, he'll see something. And I'll know like the eye lines are not right at all. And like, this is not going to work. And then he's freaking out. And then he'll hear me be like, uh, hey, we need to run that again. Could you put your eyes over here? Yeah, you there, there was a point where I was watching the footage when I was picking like the, the, the clips for the edit. Yeah. And I remember there was this point where like, there, there's a, there's a, not to ruin anything on anybody, but there's a, there was a camera in it, um, there's a and there's a there's a flash bulb, right? And I remember like we kept doing these uh, these close ups of EJ bringing the camera down, and and I remember I was like looking, I'm like the flash bulb's gone. Somebody noticed it. Somebody noticed that flash bulb's <laughs> gone. And then I just hear my dorky voice come out of nowhere and go, I think we uh, have to put the flash bulb back. <laughs> and then like a couple uh, you know, George clip, Lucas voice. You know, comes uh, on. <laughs> I think Jar Jar's the key to all this. Um, but then like. You know, I got to this uh, a couple more scenes down the road, and I get to this other scene where I'm like looking at Melina, and it's a close up of her, and her eye lines off, and I'm just like, somebody catch that, somebody catch that, somebody catch that. And then I just hear Matt being like, All right, can you just like kind of shift over a little bit to the left? And I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard too because you battle. I mean, we battled everything on this film because I know you said you wanted to get into some of that and well, the burden um, of the burden of beauty. So how it started for <laughs> so how it started for us, I guess, to give a kind of little bit of a pre-production timeline. We didn't. I didn't know he wrote anything. We haven't talked in a long time. He hits me up. I read it. Do you, I read want, it. Do you want me to explain where that came from? Oh, yeah, no. I think he should explain where the story came from. So, so like, this is a weird thing for me, and it's actually kind of fun for... Uh, are we keeping you off track or anything? No, actually, so you're naturally answering okay, a lot of good. questions that I have. So I want to make sure I'm not so like... That works, yeah. we're, we're, we're just, like, good babble. You know, that's good. Like, no, well, that's... I did that thing where you saw me, where I always try to reel it back yeah. in and get on the... That's how <laughs> our production... Me, I don't this know. is our production meetings. Right. He'll be like, we got to do this thing first, and then we go for a while, and we talk about some stuff he tells you about <laughs> right. films, and then eventually he starts hearing me be like, all right, and then I'll say this. <laughs> they can. It's like let's get to the, the points. The so like, overview. with the with the script, it was a thing where um our uh, our friend Brian, <clears throat> he was shooting this little indie film, a tiny little short film, and he had called me up and he's like, hey, I just need somebody to help me, you know, shoot the thing. And I'm like, great. And then I got there and he's like, so my uh, my actor bailed out. Will you do it? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, sure. Love you. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. so like, you know, we were working together and I was kind of like, you know, talking about like little things like with the characters and the structure and stuff, because, you know, it's just like, OK, we got to put this here or whatever. But um, I remember we had like a really great experience just collaborating. And he came up to me the one time when I was going into Cinemark, because fun fact about me, I will watch everything that comes out. So at this point, I was going to see Mary Poppins Returns. <laughs> and um, okay. I was just real excited about it. <laughs> but um, I was like walking in. And uh, he's just like, oh, dude, he's like, it'd be really fun if we started, um, you know, working on something else. He's like, I don't care. It's like, we could just film objects. And in my head, I'm like, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Because, like, you know, I, I mean, nothing against that. I know that's, like, a thing for people, like, abstract stuff. Yeah. But, like, to me, I'm, like, a narrative guy. So I was like, yeah, maybe. And then I remember I was, like, in the theater watching Emily Blunt kill it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just sitting there thinking, like, like you know, it'd be kind of neat to really take an object and write a story around it. Like not have it just be like a single object they take a photo of and then run away, but just like take an object and um, build a story around it. So I was like, okay, in my head I see a camera. Um, I see a girl in front of the camera. The girl looks sad. Why is she sad? And I just kept asking myself all these questions. So then mm -hmm. like this, the story kind of came about in the length of a shower, which is weird because you know this, you're a writer too. Mm -hmm. it takes a while for things to progress, but I just saw it very clearly. I'm like, this mm -hmm. is what it is. So I wrote it. Wrote it real quick, and then I was just like, not like real quick, you know what I mean? I'm trying to sound cool. Um, it took me a while, yeah. but I, I wrote it. I wrote it. I got it done. And then I just yeah. like, you know, I was like reading. I'm like, oh, cool, Burden of Beauty, and just kind of like threw it to the side. Because when you write your own stuff, you don't see it clearly. You're just kind of like, you'll do better next time. But I remember when he reached out to me, 
he was like, oh, we want to, we should work on something. I'm like, well, I have the script. You should check it out. And he reacted to it the way that he was just saying. He had like a kind of like an emotional thing to it. I'm like, hmm. So I had a couple more people read it. And then they had a different reactions to it. And they were like, oh, this is like my friend. I have friends like this. I'm this person. I want to be like this person. And I'm like, maybe I should reread this, mm. you know? And I was kind of going through it. And I'm like, oh, you're working out your issues. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> there's all your problems right there on the page. <laughs> yeah, let's film that. Mm. And um, literally, it was just like this thing. Like, it just kind of like snowballed at that point when you and I got together and you read it. And you're like, yeah, we should get going on, uh, you know, Filming it, I'm like, all right, can I direct it? Cool. Yeah, um, no, it was. Um, so we got together, we read it, and then, um, you know, my train of thought that I did have <laughs> that I'm gonna lose right now. So sorry. Uh, it's okay. So, yeah, now I'm not gonna fully remember all the pieces, but um, so I read it. We got. Uh, I liked it. We got together. So we were like, okay, let's let's just film this. And I mean, I've never really produce something like a short film end to end like it to this caliber before so i was like well we're gonna have to raise some money because it's like we didn't really have much money so we we got together um we didn't even have a place to shoot this either so we we're like what are we gonna do we needed to do their kickstarter indiegogo we knew we had to do some crowdfunding of some sort um and i know i possess enough of the skills to like get something together so that we could do a campaign but we still kept running into places we didn't know where to go and then three jacks yeah, that was uh, one of those moments. Because um, I remember I was like trying to find a place to do casting, because things can sound super creepy depending on where you choose it. You know, if you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got this hotel room out on a. Uh, you know, sounds sounds <laughs> yeah, like, come to like, God knows yeah. where you're walking. I got an apartment. Yeah. You know, it's it's pretty cool. Uh, ignore the cat, <laughs> but you know, people, you know, you you, you want to give them somewhere where they feel comfortable and where they can kind of like. Uh, not like you want to do this kind of an interview here, not, exactly, in, right? like, yes. not in a basement somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Even though we're in a basement. No, okay. um, <laughs> There's some chains like, over here. Yeah, I remember I was like really at a loss. I was just sitting, like I went to the Radisson, right? And I was like, hey, there's this uh, movie we want to film and we need to do casting. Can we film here? And the lady's like, yeah, that would be awesome. Like, she's like, I don't even think they're going to charge anything. She's like, because, you know, like we support local arts. And, um, you know, we just want to talk to uh, my manager, corporate lady. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, she'll be fine with it. So I talked to the lady and she's just like, not fine with death it. Death in the voice. You know, <laughs> she's just like, yeah, that'll be like $500, please. And I'm like, oh. Well, I, I was thinking of like doing it for nothing, but that's cool. We'll get back to you. Um, yeah. But like, I remember I was really down and out about it because I was I was I was at Three Jacks and I was in the basement and um, you know just like sitting there, uh, thinking like, what am I gonna do to get a place locked down for casting? Because it is like you need a few hours. You can't just do it real quick and be like, everyone, quick, we gotta go. Um, but then my my, my brother in law who owns uh, Three Jacks, um, he was just kind of like, well, why don't you just do casting here? And I'm like, you're going to give me the keys to your livelihood? I can't promise you I'm not going to burn this place down. Right. And then I did. And it was weird. But he built it back up from the ground. And um, they're still serving the best burgers in town. But, um, yeah, it was just like this weird thing. Like So, like, John, you know, he, like, let us do our um, our casting there, our Indiegogo video. Yep. Uh, we shot a scene in there and and you know so three jacks even just doing the screening there is like so wildly appropriate you know because it was just like that's where everything started you know so you put out a casting call i assume and then you know did just uh you know what kind what kind of people show up to that in in, uh, <laughs> in dunmore of we all got places? lucky yeah we did but everyone who showed up was like you know they were they were excited they were good and and there was like a couple of them where you're like you know this is gonna be great. So for like the first time we did the casting, um, you know, our actress Melina, she kind of ruined it for us because I think we were both <laughs> excited about having. Oh that. Yeah, 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 we were yeah. so excited to just be like going through videos and being like, yeah, this one. She's the first person that comes into the door, like through the door, and reads, and we're like, he oh, literally it's just be her. looked at each other. It was just like, <laughs> because, that, because for me, sorry guys, it's, you know, because I set the cameras up. We just had one little small camera to record the whole casting, but then I brought. The one I was going to use for the film, just so that I could have a different set of eyes looking through, like um, to see what the actors and actress, actresses would look like on like the eighty-five or something else. So, and but when she stood up there to read her lines, like there's just something. Uh, I hate using the word cinematic today. Oh, everyone right. says that, but like there, she just has something that 
just says I'm an actress and how she looked on screen it was just like we just looked at each other and we just knew that that had to had to be Kira and you know we were right she did a great job and just fearless and then with EJ like obviously he knows EJ for how uh, however long um so that was kind of easy and he'll explain more about EJ but with Chris um, this is when I, again, I'm just getting back in the loop. I know nobody. I, you know, I didn't, I was gone for a while and came back and I didn't like really have any ties to anybody, but we were at, uh, poor Richard, right? I think that's the bar yeah, that yeah. I met and KK. So I don't know any of these people, but like, I, uh, he suggested somebody to, for us, which was Chris and, um, you know, we, again, we just got so lucky because these guys acted their asses off. And it just there's moments where we're like saying action that we're forgetting to say cut because we're just watching the the monitor just in, <laughs> yeah. in awe. Chris Chris has got this. Uh, you're gonna see him down the road doing stuff. He's one of those mm-hmm. guys. Because I remember the when we were filming his first scene, I was so worried about it because we were trying to get all Molina stuff done first. So all day long we're filming Molina, and we started. It was like eight, seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And Chris is literally just sitting back in what was like our makeshift green room. Um, and he's just like, he's laughing, he's having fun and stuff. But like, I'm like, he's gonna be like tired. He's gonna be sluggish by the time we get him in front of the camera at six o'clock at night. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, just give him a few takes, warm up, whatever. So we're setting up and I'm like, you know, like you come through the door, you walk up to the camera, this is your framing, you know, do your lines. And he walks through the door, and everyone on the monitors, they're all just like, <laughs> like, even my, for me, too, like, I'm like, I, like, I wrote this stuff, so I feel very connected to it, but he had me like, I'm like, my eyes are watering, you know, it's just like that thing where I'm like, he's so, he just killed it. And then I remember, because he's doing his, his DP gig, he's just like, He's like, oh, so do you want to set up for another take? And I'm like, I don't think we're going to need one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the take that's in the film, like, yeah. one and done. And I know that, like, what I was trying to get at before with the schedule is like with with short films, it's like there's so there's nothing but problems. Everything was a burden. So we like to make the joke all the time: the burden of the burden of beauty. It's like you're not working on this film unless your stuff's just breaking everywhere, not working, <laughs> or whatever. And that's from pre-production to production to post-production to sa- anything. Like it, there was problems everywhere. But we. Uh, I have a good friend, Chad Bonk, um, oh, who, no. yeah, I know. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. I'm just gonna say, like, I just, I, we were gonna shoot there first, um, and we got, like, the whole first scene shot over a weekend, and, you know, then we had to re- basically reshoot and get a different location. We just weren't able to uh, use anything, so we ended up having to, you know, pretty much do it all, and again, almost the whole film pretty much in a weekend after that, and I mean, it's just, you working, that's why Chris was sitting around for so long waiting, because we had to have everyone there, we just, we had our shot list, but the schedule was just going to be insane, that we were like, not sure what the call times would be for everybody, but, um, I mean, we really just got through, we were running, I mean, we are running out of time, I mean, we were there until like, the one day was like 17 hours or something crazy, um, but it takes me to that fourth scene, though. I wanted to get to this while we were here because it goes back to that organic uh, relationship that we have, and we had no time. I mean, it was the very end of the night. We had begged Melina to stay. She was still doing her finals. You know, uh. God bless her soul being there for <laughs> us so late at night. And uh, Hang out with us. We hacks. literally had to shoot. I don't even know how many setups and shots just to get her done because she could not come back for anything. And it was just like, all right, let's go. And it was like, camera down, perfect. Camera down, perfect. How about here? You know? but, but it was like a thing, though, because it, it almost sounds like a little bit like sloppier than it was. It was more just that like we both, I don't know if this happens to people sometimes, where it's just like you're both in that same state of frenzy, and it's just like everything, I think, became very clear. Like it's like the camera needs to be here, but we weren't talking anymore. We are mm-hmm. just like, and the camera, and it, and it, perfect, boom. You know, that, that was how we had to do a couple of those shots. And then you, in, in my head, I'm like, so fearful to look at the footage because I'm like, oh, it just it just has to look terrible. And then you look Some at it Some of the like, best stuff came yeah, from that rapid these fire. beautiful shots and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, so uh, art from adversity. That's a thing. <laughs> right. And, and even like the, the, some of the other stuff too when we were filming, I mean, talking about those kind of things, like that's, the, this is kind of like, you know, stuff you hear about on set. But I mean, not to make drag things down a little bit, but um, 
I remember when he and I got together and he, um, you know, he read the script and, you know, you know that part. But then it was like, we're like, okay, so now we're going to start doing like post-production. And then in the midst of that, it was like a month later, it was like my, you know, my, my father passed away. So that I'm was. Sorry to hear that, man. <laughs> Trust me, we're not done. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So like, this is where it begins. Yeah, this is where <laughs> this is where it begins. It's because it was like this thing. Because like that's like a really profound thing. Oh yeah. But you know, it was like that yeah. thing where I was just like, okay, so this ball's still moving, you know. So it's like, you're dealing with that, but then you can't like. It's like you can't stop. You can't think about it because it's just like well, the second we stop communicating and we stop filming, it's like things can just. So you have to keep going. Right. And then it was like, you know, we we're doing the casting. We have the, the posters up and we're getting real excited about like, you know, doing casting now. And then like a week before we were actually doing casting, I actually lost my mom too. So that was like less than six months apart from each other. Wow. So literally when we were doing casting the night before, right? Like the, like the, the night of casting, the very next day was when like we had to go to my mom's funeral. Mm -hmm. So people are like, how was that take? And you're like, what? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> looks great you know because you're just really somewhere yeah. so then we're doing like we we're talking about with the the funding video which sounds fun um we put it up and i'm just like these two kind of weird losses i'm still just having to go around and like hustle money and stuff i'm like yeah you should yeah. check out our indiegogo it's the... and then you know we were like getting closer and closer to when the last day is and we make our budget and we actually went over it COVID. Yeah. <laughs> it was like two yeah. days later. I'm like, what is happening? You know? So like the world shuts down and we're like, okay, what do you do? You know? Right. So everything shuts down and then things start opening up a little bit and we just talk to everybody. And there's so many themes of, within the story about people not connecting when they should in isolation where I'm like, you know, this is not a kissing movie, you know? Right. So like we could, realistically do this if we play it safe you know everyone just follows safety measures and stuff right so we did what they were doing in the industry we just shot our stuff but we were smart about it and safe about it um so like that other shoot we had we started we had a weekend and then it got uh shut down so you're like ah, okay so then we had to find a new location which was serendipitous because it was more in line with what i had in my head anyways it was like ex almost like literally lifted out of my head. So it was, again, serendipitous. But then it was just like everywhere along the line from that point, it was like if we needed, um, like our audio was damaged because there's like cars or children playing in the uh, background. Oh, the, yeah, <laughs> the entire time we were at the second location, they, they, these kids show up, to, and we're in the middle of nowhere, by the way, but the, the these kids showed up with their father and they're screaming outside and I'm outside asking to be quiet and they just kept doing it, so. Um, I mean, that that's again, shout out to Three Jacks. We had to do ADR in their little closet when it was hot out. <laughs> I mean, this closet out. was smaller than this couch, and we had like four people standing in there. It's it's August. It is ridiculous. But I will say though, with with the film to tie on to what you were saying with your with your parents, is like there's so much there's so much in this film when it comes to, to people that uh, you try to like you always try to keep, you know, your loved ones alive. You always keep try to keep them part of the conversations and, and what have you. And um, Matt Rinaldi, who did the music, his brother was really important to us, Johnny. And we were actually talking about him on the, on the ride here, making jokes and having a good time. And um, Matt worked on the score, and some of the stuff was inspired by his brother. So, like, you know, your parents are, are on there, you know, and then Johnny. And it's like, and, you know, my uncle uh, Gene passed away the very first of the year uh, from COVID and like I was showing him uh, some of the VFX shots I was making and excited that like, hey, we're having a film, right? It's exciting that you get to show that to your f friends and family, but then, you know, you start losing people, it puts a lot of stuff in, in uh, to perspective, but I'm just happy that what this film means to me, no matter what, if people like it, they don't like it or whatever, nothing's gonna change because of this film and then what it kind of represents for me and the journey and our friendship and everything else. So I just kind of wanted to add that on to It's It's cool, to too, because it really is. It's like you're kind of putting the people that you love into the art, you know? Right. There's, there's like a part, and it's a very prominent scene where, like, you know, Chris walks in to talk to Melina at one point, and she's writing in this notebook, and that notebook was literally, like, the last thing that I ever got to buy my mother. So it's just kind of like a nice way to just kind of, you know, do a little thing for her, but... Yeah, it was just like a really 
difficult period of time, but we got it done. And then it's like the most amazing thing happens. You watch the final cut of it and you're just like, it was all kind of worth it. Mm. You know, like you just see it and you're like, all that frustration, like all that, you know, just being like, like, I don't think this is going to happen. It's going to happen. Like all that pain that you go through throughout the entire journey. And then you see it and you're like, oh, this was worth it. Like this was worth every feeling, every negative feeling, every, just all of it. And I don't know. I'm it's a good way to keep you grounded. Yeah. I'm really proud of what we were able to accomplish because everything that broke, People we had love. to fix it. <laughs> and it's like those who you're doing it for kind of keeps you on that that uh, road and we didn't make that much I mean we didn't raise that much money we didn't really even have like you know a cinema camera per se or anything else you know we just had like a little uh, interchangeable like photography camera that we used to film which many people are doing today it's really easy you know they make good quality stuff but like I mean it was like maybe 10 years old so you know we just kind of just took whatever we had and you know we made sure that uh, even lighting we need I mean there's one wide shot in this film. No, there's more than one wide shot, but there's this wide shot in the film that has every light that we have in it because not only did we have to light our talent with this limited lights, we actually needed to use them as practicals as well because we were in a photo shoot. <laughs> so, like, we can't afford to get photo lights and have lights to light everybody. So now I'm sitting here scratching my head, drawing schematics and stuff, being like, well, how am I going to take what we have and use it as practical as well as, as lighting them? So there is a shot of... Um, Melina, who plays Kira, who sits there lonely in there, and all these lights are around her in that one shot, and that's all the lights that we had for the whole film. So I always, I love that because it's like, you know, in the future, things will hopefully get bigger, you know, productions will have more money and we'll have more equipment, but, you know, we did this just because, you know, we had a lot of passion and we cared, and, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, we didn't have a lot of equipment, we just had a bunch of people with passion and talent, and, you know, again, it just, it keeps us grounded to keep us moving forward, and... I'm just really proud of what we we did, but I am excited for the next one and the next one. And you know. so, was this the first project for Ravenview Productions? Is that yeah? Like it's kind of like the the foundation of it. Yeah, it, it's um, the foundation is a good way to put that. Yeah, it was our film school to basically <laughs> do this film. <laughs> Now, uh, you guys have talked about the locations. Are uh, for locals watching? Are there uh, some that people might recognize? Oh, uh, well, the back room to Three Jacks, we had to gut and <laughs> yeah. turn that into a... It, you won't know. It. It's like the craziest thing. You look at it, and you're like, that's that room? Because yeah. it's lit real neat, and uh, the you know we, we shot at the... Uh, I don't know what where the community center is. I just know it's, it's down like Kaiser by West. It's Ransom, like West Side, yeah. but past the high school. So I don't even know. It's just a community center. Oh, uh, okay. We yeah. just rented one of those buildings. I think I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Where people usually rent out for parties and stuff like that. We just right. rented that. And then pretty much three jacks. Kaiser Valley Community Center, maybe? I think so. I, yeah, it could be. Yeah. We'll roll with that. Yeah, yeah. we'll roll with that. <laughs> um, yeah, there was very, very They limited. all look about the same. Yeah, really just inside. once you get yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah, but we gutted the place. We took all their stuff out, put it outside. <laughs> I built it all up. It looks neat. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, so you, you got the, you got the, the budget together uh, through some crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And uh, you... How, how did you... Uh, I guess how how did you plan out how you were going to shoot everything and stuff? Because I'm sure there's, uh, you know, people who are interested in film that are watching this that are like, you know, where do you even start? Like, where do you begin? So are you, uh, you know, writing out a plan first? You know, how does that work? For for me, like the where, it's sort of started. I think the the foundational stuff. Get your script together. That's super important because everything's going to kind of stem from that, really. Um, then I remember like waking myself up at like four in the morning before work and just like laying on my floor, like dreaming up shots and just like making a shot list and being like, I want it like this, feeling like this. So I didn't know this at the time, but apparently um, people don't plan out every second of their, of their <laughs> yeah. film. Yeah. I, I, I literally wrote out every second <laughs> of the film. Like, you know, it's like medium, wide, whatever. Um, you don't have to do that at home, but if you choose to, it was made, it sort of saved our <laughs> yeah, it made my job um, easier because we had to we needed that stuff anyway. So script, he had a shot, shot list, list which was awesome. We had to break the script down. So you just you get a bunch of colored highlighters. You look for anything that could be a prop, anything that could be you know like a person or your clothing, whatever it is. Just if there's something in the description that's 
in the scene, like you just mark it. And depending on what it is, if it's uh, clothing or a prop or a light or whatever, you just mark it different colors and start making a list. So we, I made a pre-production checklist for us to kind of start going of like all the different steps we need to do, like location scouting, casting, uh, obviously budget, which we did the Indiegogo for, um, you know, and just, we really just had to do this by ourselves. It was, uh, you know, it, it was a tough thing because I never did this before. So that's kind of how I did it. I just kept going to the internet. I just kept like searching things. <laughs> and, but luckily again, he, he's a psychopath. He, he broke down every <laughs> shot. So I was able to then um, use my experience from filming things before to just la to label his shots okay. so that the slate, uh, the clapper for people who don't know what slate is. Mm. Um, so for all the, the numbers and shots and letters that are on there, I just basically assigned them to his shots already. Uh, so that that helped a whole bunch. And then as for the shooting schedule, I wish that we had one. We just knew that we had that location and that amount of time. So we just made everybody show up at like nine in the morning. And we literally sometimes were there at like, I mean, I remember I was there at like eight the one time and didn't leave until, or didn't get home until the sun was back up the next day. Cause I'd have to break down everything, <laughs> pack it into a car, which is back seat, front seat, tr everywhere you could put something in my lap to just get the equipment there right. and back. But You know, it's another good thing, too, um, that might be helpful for people listening. Um, your blocking is super important. So understanding that is super important <laughs> before you start filming. Because if you're making um, an independent film, as you heard us talking about, you're, you don't have a lot of time. So... Um, I had this weird thing that I did where I got graph paper and I kind of drew out the room, right? I kind of like had an idea of how it'd be okay. the, the way the space would look. And then I got um, a piece of transparent paper and I drew all of their movements. And then like I took the next actor and I laid that down and drew all of their movements. So I knew exactly where everybody was gonna go when we started filming. Does that make sense? It's so, yeah. right, so, you, so, so you are a true psycho. <laughs> yeah. No, to put this in perspective. 100%. Put this yeah. in perspective. A very visual guy. So he literally, or top down graph paper, he has a schematic of the room. And then he's got a clear sheet in, a, in one color green for one actor. Then he puts another sheet on top of that. Oh, yeah. So now you've got other lines of this actor. Like yeah. he literally had everything like schematic out, which again, that did help us. And I will say for, um, for doing independent films, weird? you definitely need, when it comes to your equipment, definitely less is more when you're especially doing things on tight budgets because you need lighter equipment. You still need to have your, I mean, lights are, I will say, most important. Today you can film everything on your phone, but, you know, try to find easier, lighter things that you can use. And I say, like, you can almost use any light even though we already had this conversation about the the fluorescence in here <laughs> but like just diffuse it you know be careful where the lighting is from your where your camera's going to be stuff like that but just light stuff you know less is more smaller is more you know obviously as you get bigger but just get bigger cameras right be the guy walks through and gets sure. excited but he's he's fun with that stuff though because i i was always a fan of watching him set up lights because it would just be this little detail where it's like, you know, like EJ, for example, I remember the one shot, he was like kind of just like looking at the photos and you're just staring at it. And he's like, hold on a second. Uh, come over here. Can you just hold my cell phone? <laughs> and, like, Why? And, and he had this light and it's this very, very, very subtle thing going along his face. And it just mm -hmm. gives it this really beautiful look. So it's like, he, he, I think another thing that's good to know if you're making your own films is um, bring people in who know what they're doing or like want to learn more because even yeah. like the stuff that we, we talked about this before like this we, we don't ever ever want to get to a point where we're like yeah we know everything because right. then you suck <laughs> you know so it's like you just find people who always want to be better that want to learn more because that's that's what the, that's what we do it's just the collective genius and having that camaraderie of being excited for whoever has the best I shot or the best idea yeah <laughs> yeah a lot of happy accidents yeah. that's a big that's a a big thing but there's there's so much i mean there's so much to talk about when it comes to like the process of independent film and, and helping people but like you know raven view productions does have a page on facebook little plug there and, you know they could go follow that ask us questions there too we'd love to try to try to take these sporadic brains and try to put the glasses on and focus to give some information because you know we just we're just 
I guess just two geeks that like to sit around and just love this <laughs> stuff. So you know, it goes every direction, you know but the, the, yeah, every direction, but the way you need to go. What do you mean? You know what you're calling me a nerd? You and I one time years ago, we drove to Philadelphia because oh, no the other theater was showing Diary of the Dead. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. So we drove to Philly. We drove a couple hours to go see Diary of the Dead. That's. That's yes. the kind of guy you are, Rich. G- G- George Romero's okayest film. Yeah, okay. yeah, it gets a lot of garbage from people, but it's like, all right. I just you know sometimes people are like, "This is the worst movie ever made," and I'm like, "You don't no. watch a lot of movies, right? Seriously, you know, even the worst movie probably isn't as bad as people say it is." Well, yeah, I mean, you know, famously everybody labels Plan 9 as the the worst movie of all time. It's like, not even close. Like, that movie is so entertaining. It is. so much fun. I fucking love that movie. We were talking about that. um, Like, uh, E.J. Leeson was in the movie, who, uh, by the way, is just amazing (laughs) as a performer. I I, I can't wait for everybody to see him. But um, he and I have this shared love of uh, Tommy Wiseau, oh, like a of lot course. of people. Yeah. Not in a way it's like where I'm ever like punching down on the guy. I just, yeah. I'm like, and the guy clearly was not knowledgeable about what he was doing, but he believed he did. Right. And he made a movie that people celebrate even though it's technically inept. So is that a bad movie if people celebrate it? Uh, absolutely not. The year that it came out, like, I'm pretty sure most people probably couldn't tell you what the best picture winners were. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what's the best uh, picture of 2004? Most people probably don't know. <laughs> um, but people still talk people about t- the room. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, They're not going subjective. to midnight screenings of Oscar-winning films. They're, they're going to see that stuff. I you met know? Tommy Wiseau in- once. <laughs> did you? I did. It was weird. <laughs> If you can believe it, it was just like because no, he, really? he was on he was on the Golden Globes for the Disaster Artist. Yeah, and they're like, oh, did you meet anybody fun? I mean, he's just like, oh yeah, I met everybody. I met I met Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you sure did. Tommy. That's everybody. <laughs> oh, that's fun, Bob. <laughs> So for those who aren't like, uh, you know, the super film nerds, uh, you know, you're credited as the director, you're credited as the uh, director of photography. What is the difference for people there? What were you, what are you doing on set, you know, day to day? Like, what are you, what is, what is the, your job? What, uh, what processes do you have to go through? Um, I would say that the director's job primarily is to make sure everybody's making the same movie. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's like all a consistent the, vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's the thing. Like things can get even some really great performances mm-hmm. that people give might not be right for the film that you're making. Right. So there's a lot of like you just kind of like looking through things and just being like, okay, um, you know, this line coming out of your mouth feels weird. Try like you know, just basically mm-hmm. what I said. Like just make sure mm-hmm. everybody's on the same page. And I'm more like public relations. So, because he's the vision, right? So, when when you're the vision, that stuff sometimes, depending on like how it could work, maybe you could rub someone the wrong way, maybe you can't. But my job is to make sure that all the departments are working together to create his vision, right? Because as the director of photography or the cinematographer, you know, I'm really just, again, chasing what's in that frame. Um, but that that involves lighting, actors what are we looking at um color even you know wardrobe like there's just like everything's important so you know he could have a change on the fly they spent maybe five hours on this piece of costume or something and then he went nah i just i don't think that's gonna work so my job a big a lot of it is uh just being like a politician i guess you know and just being a uh, easy to work with because if you can do that and keep everyone happy, I think that's why Chris said are all film sets like this that you get the best out of everybody. So you know the big difference is my I'm pretty much in charge of like lighting and everything else, but again that comes from what he and I have talked about prior to the film. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's an interesting way to probably put it. It's like if I have like some kind of weird kooky vision. Um, he extracts extracts it with surgical precision. That's the, my favorite thing about him is that like kind of what I was saying before about some of those shots mm. where it's just kind of like I'm looking for this, and then he would just be like, like how about this? And you're like, yeah, perfect. And I I don't know I just I I love working with you because like you do challenge me to be a better filmmaker and be more creative. But what I will say also for anyone who's interested in being uh, like a director of photography or just a camera guy or however, like take photos. 
uh, I always kept, everyone kept bugging me to take photos so I would shoot a lot of video and stuff and they'd be like, oh, it looks good. Why don't you take pictures? Why don't you take pictures? I'm like, I don't take pictures. That's different. <laughs> I don't take photos. I'm not a photographer. Lowly but, photographer. you know, I am happy for all those who have pushed me because for anybody who who've seen my photos, like, it's fun. And I even shocked myself. I'm actually a better cinematographer now uh, as a photographer, because you got to capture everything in one still moment. It can't move. There's, you can't cheat that. It's right. right there. It doesn't move. So there's no smoke and mirrors. So, you know, the lighting and everything and uh, composition has to be pretty much on point to and, and direct someone's eyes where you want them to go. So, you know, that's my advice to somebody. And the biggest thing is you just have to also, you just have to do it because like you could say you want to do something, but you are that when you do it. There's a lot of that, you know, you'd mentioned that before where, you know, people talk about creative projects and things they want to do, especially movies. It seems like a thing that everybody wants to do. Uh, everybody's got that, maybe that one idea that they think is like, oh, it really stands out from everything else. But actually going through the process of making it happen and getting the right people together. And I think, like you said, it's, it's so important to have that cooperation and to have people who understand what you're trying to do. And you're all on the same team because I I, th I think there's a lot of people who like let their ego get get uh, in the way, or uh, they just want to do everything themselves because they think that like you know I'm the only one that could possibly do that. But filmmaking is really a collaborative process. It's incredibly collaborative because I, honestly, when I watch it, like I'm not sitting there thinking like, oh, I got to write those words. Like I'm just like yeah. amazed by like the performances, like. So just what he's capable of doing, like Matt Rinaldi's score, which I can't wait for people to hear. Mm -hmm. um, it's all like just, it's not just you. And why would you want it to be? It's fun. Like it's, 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 right. it's this amazing process where you get to just like <laughs> play. Well, every time I meet somebody who is into this kind of stuff and they're just an incredible dick, I'm like, this is never gonna fucking happen. Yeah, <laughs> that's the problem. Because they, they get... you're just such an asshole that no one's gonna work. No one's gonna put the kind of time and effort it takes into making a film Dude, and work with you because you're a, a fucking dick. The <laughs> best things, the best things, really come from the hardest things. And I say that, and everyone's always like, "What the fuck does that mean?" And it's, <laughs> it's the hardest things in life are balance, right? They always say that, like work-life balance, relationship, anything balance. So yeah. I think when you're collaborating and there's no ego, and you hit that point of balance, that nirvana, where mm -hmm. he says something, and you're like, "Fuck yeah!" And I say something, he's like, "Yeah!" And you're just like high five, and like, <laughs> like when you're not like trying to high five, it just comes naturally out of nowhere. It's like those are those moments, you know, uh, that euphoria, that whatever. It's like in that. <laughs> happens a lot when when we work together because i'll think i have a great idea then he'll say something I'm like fuck yeah and then it's like <laughs> back and forth and it's like that's the beauty in it do you remember when we were we were filming the scene with the it's actually in the trailer when the when the photos land oh yeah we're, yeah, yeah. we're like you'd be surprised how many times just to get those photos to land a certain way <laughs> we're just like throwing them across the table and they finally landed like they do in the trailer and we're just like what? We're yeah, like, like everyone, we threw those things like 20, 30 times. Yeah, ago. it was terrible. I'm and just like, then we realized, though, after all that, that whole joke about eye lines and everything, is that they were going the wrong way because we put the camera on the other side of the, uh, the, the line. So 180 <laughs> rule, guys, look that up. But And so I like had to flip it and then flip it in the computer, but it's it's great, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, but that was fun. But that's that's the point. That's the that collective thing. You can't have the egos because, like you said, it's like I don't drop in names or nothing. But there's all these people that I saw do that stuff locally, and it's like you get excited that oh maybe I could work with these people. But then it's like you just see how they are on social media, and you're like, yeah, right. I don't want to work you. with you whatsoever <laughs> because I don't want that. We want to have it as stress free as possible because there's nothing but stress when you're chasing a dream like this or doing these kind of things with budgets and time and, and people and equipment and whatever. So, you know, the last thing we need is some a-hole on set <laughs> or something, you know, so. And that was one of the nice things too about everybody that was there for us is that they were all like good people, you know, and they just wanted, like it was it was crazy because I, I, I always think about this, like why like I love making movies is that I don't know if anyone's noticed, but people are getting a little angry out there, mm. a little crazy out there yeah. in the world, you know? A little bit. You know, people drive Don't make white jokes anymore. People, <laughs> people drive white-knuckled now. <laughs> um, but, like, I, I remember when we were filming, it's like the world shut off for us or something. Because it was like we're all, like, laughing. We're all just, like, cel basically celebrating cinema, you know? And it's so great. And, and even just having, like, EJ 
you know, because you know EJ. Everyone oh, knows yeah. EJ. Everyone knows EJ. But <laughs> it's so funny because, like, I didn't write that part for him. Like, I, that was, like, the thing. I, I always wanted to make that clear to people. Like, I wasn't just like, oh, he's, like, a really good friend of mine. I just want him to have this part. Yeah. But I got lucky that he was the person that got the part. Because I, I just remember I was, like, writing it, and I had seen him do, like, Shakespeare in the Park once. And... Um, I just remember, like, I always just thought of him as such a fun, goofy guy, right? And then I see him play, I was like a guard or something in Macbeth, and he just has this, like, look on his face, like, it's real, like, intense, very serious look on his face. And I'm like, oh, that's not EJ. And for some reason, when I was writing his character, that the character he ended up playing, I just kept, like, seeing him more and more and more in my head, and I'm like, I think this is supposed to be played by EJ. Sorry for the wall. Um, <laughs> I was like, I really think this is supposed to be him. Mm. And then when he started doing it, I'm like, yeah, it's 100% supposed to be him. But what was great about it was that I got to work with him <laughs> because he was so much fun. Because yep. you look over at him, and for no good reason, he's dancing. And, and everyone's <laughs> laughing and having fun, and then they're dancing, and you're just like, all right. It's like night and day seeing EJ or Mac, you know, because yeah. that's who he plays. Dramatic. Mac so. Flanagan. Uh, but mm-hmm. like he... Um, Not a Walt Flanagan reference. He but. just... <laughs> I don't know, but it's those moments, though. It's those accidents that happen and all that other stuff. We always say the happy accidents is anything that went wrong on the film that made it better was on purpose. But there's things that just... We were all so tired because the days are always so long. And I remember we had finally... Three Jacks, that second scene seemed like everything was smooth. But right at the end, we're doing the last shot after I almost dropped the camera on the floor. Oh but we'll God. get... To, but like, uh, he, uh, Mac wears his hat forward the whole time. Well, for some reason, in that shot, he had his hat backwards. So when the door shuts and we see him, they're looking at his pictures. I don't know where the hat's backwards. Uh, we... You know, we caught, I caught that, but like, it's just funny, like, when those moments happen after you've, like, put the blood, sweat, tears in, and you're tired, and it's just like, <laughs> and something like that happens. <laughs> you know, having EJ around to dance around, or when he, uh, EJ, and when everyone did read for casting, EJ just sat there and did Alan Rickman from Die Hard. He didn't even he didn't even read any lines, any lines from the script. He was just like shoot the glass and stuff like that, and it was hilarious. And you know, you need that kind of energy on set because this stuff's supposed to be fun. I mean, you're supposed to take it seriously, but like, you can't take it all too seriously. Yeah, there's that Richard Donner quote that I really liked when he was doing Superman. Where you're just basically like, you know, you take the material seriously, you don't take yourself too seriously. And I, that's words that I tried to live by because, you know, it was like when we were coming up for the, the, the getting this screening together, uh, three jacks, um, I remember we, we, like we were just talking about what we could do that would be fun. And I was like, oh, how about like a, like a drink special and we'll, for the burden of beauty, we'll have like the bourbon of beauty. And, and I just started laughing and then I was just kind of like, yeah, make a pun out of your movie. You know, like, <laughs> Because some people wouldn't, they just have like this attitude about like art. They're like, oh, I can't joke about nothing. I'll I'm put it serious. on screen right now, actually. Oh, there oh, it is. Yeah. The, the Raven bourbon Brew. Be- the Raven Brew. Yeah. Um, and the Bourbon of Beauty. Uh, my sister Caitlin made those drinks and she did a great job. Nice. She's uh, perpetually got my back. Um, Shout out Walter for holding the yeah. cell phone. <laughs> Walter. Um, that was like, you know, you, you don't plan things out when you're doing all this independent stuff. And we're like, oh, we got to take these pictures. Oh, yeah, we can't light these drinks because we didn't bring anything. Well, we got cell phones and some paper to bounce things around. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm sure you get the question a lot. What is the movie about? You know, what, what genre is it? That sort of thing. And I'm sure that's, you know, with something like this, where it seems, it, I'm getting the impression anyway from reading the description and watching the trailer, that you kind of want to leave that open until you actually watch yeah. it. You don't want people to exactly know what they're getting my, into right away. My problem is, is that I have this thing where like, you need to have like a plot written out for people, right? Like when sure. you're like doing promotions and stuff. People want to know like that little like log line, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, log line? Yeah. Yeah, log line. I don't know what I'm doing. The um, spine. Yeah. <laughs> like, you want to have that written out, you need something there. But to me it was always like when we are like when I was like writing it, it was always just a thing where I'm like, this isn't really what the point of it is. The, it's all just about the characters, you know? Like, it's it's so much of the story what makes it so interesting and, and some of the more like beautiful moments of it, it's just about like this, this, this stuff going on within the characters and like their inability to um, get over their own like weaknesses or um, what you project onto other people and how that's actually like damaging to them. So it's like, I, I just comically wanted to write this down on a piece of paper of somebody were like, hey, what's your script about? Like, yeah. 
Uh, a young and lonely woman's feeling of isolation is deepened after she takes part in a high-profile photo shoot and learns the destructive power of its self-image. And you're like, that's about 2% of what it actually is. That's a nice little, like, you know, overview of what the story's about. It's like the but setup it's, there. Yeah, but it's like, there's just so much more going on in it and so much going on with those actors. So, but I, def I would definitely say it's a drama, for sure. Um, I'll say that much, because I don't want to ruin anything, guys. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Well, and we have the, the poster here, too. That came out really nice. Oh, that was a wonderful Maddie Wise. I try my best to get things done, because we don't have graphic <laughs> designers or whatever, and it's like, you know, I just end up being uh, the mad of all trades, it seems, for everything, because, you know, if it's editing or coloring or... Uh, uh, sound uh, editing or posters or whatever. It's like right now that's kind of has to be my wheelhouse until we bring in more people and, and we will. And that's what we're Smart. kind of excited about. We, we want to grow a team that we get comfortable with that we, so we can produce more things a little bit quicker, but just better stuff. Cause again, it comes from collaboration and we want to get things a little bit bigger to the point where we can hopefully maybe get some of like interns from like the universities locally, because I, it's hard when you when you're trying to figure out well how should I do film how can I get into film and I remember I went to Lackawanna Community College for a very short time when you were there and it's like every time you try to take a film class or something they're kind of more like on a communications class but but Andy and Emmy they put a lot into what theirs was to give you at least a nice intro to what you wanted to do but we want to give real hands-on stuff we want to be able to you know, do things where we can pay interns and like bring them on to actually get hands on stuff. But, you know, it's in the future, right? You know, you <laughs> right. One, one, one little baby step at a time. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the, we... the poster, that was another one of those fun little things that we would do. Cause I, one of my favorite things working with Matt uh, yeah. is figuring it, things out. Yeah. It's literally <laughs> us just being like, what is it? Cause at first I we were talking about having it be like a lens, not a mirror, but then the mirror, and you'll see it in the film, it's so, important to the film like that that it's, it's just yeah, like right that, in front of us when your reflection yeah. is the enemy is very important um but yeah because that yeah that was my little tagline i was just like oh that seems to work really well but um we yeah we were just like pitching that that poster like back and forth for a little bit and then he just like sends this thing back to me and i'm like yeah that'll do <laughs> <laughs> it's, fu it's funny though cool. <laughs> but i think like to give a again i'm very visual so to give a visual representation of how any part of our process works together when we got to figure out a poster or a shot or whatever it's like mm. he has a pot of pasta i have a pot of pasta and we're just going back and forth throwing it at each other and it's like the few pieces that are sticking because it really is a back and forth like he says red i say blue i say blue he says green but it's like we we're building on it every time and it's it's better every back and forth that we have so um you know i i can't help but just try to give some kind of visual to that because that's kind of what that poster was. It's just we get on the phone sometimes and we're like hour, two hours, and it's just like boom, 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 and then we have something, and it's just always like that. So because you, I think it was like you were like you're the one who ultimately went with like the the, the correct mirror, mm -hmm. and I was just like, and when your reflection is the enemy, and we're like, good, great, move on. <laughs> like that's kind of like how it works, but yeah. So thank you for the like poster. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, we'll, we'll take a couple questions. It looks like they're all from Bobby Keller. <laughs> so, who, I don't know why he has any questions, because uh, he is a filmmaker in his own right, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, famous Dether Man. I saw it. I, mean, it's, I think Bob needs to do more movies, because Bob is hilarious in that movie. Yeah, he is pretty funny. <laughs> I, I remember like watching that, and every time he'd come on screen, I would just lose it. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I think he, he should do a lot more film. So, uh, well, first he asked why I am Egon in this episode. I am Egon in every episode. Okay? <laughs> I just don't. I wish I had his like cool little curly hair that he had in like the cartoon. Mm -hmm. That weird like kind of loopy. The real thing. Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would I would love that. Where's but, those uh, quality cartoons today? I know, right? <laughs> um, let's see. Camille says, "What a bunch of nerds." What? Lemons, what, shush. What would give you that impression? I, yeah. really, I don't understand. Classic Camille. I mean, it's definitely not this conversation. It's definitely not the toys all over the place. I'm, I'm sure that doesn't uh, come off that way. Uh, Bobby says, when are you remaking Air Bud? Um, we, we're in talks right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the dog really wants a lot of money. Mm -hmm. 
and a giant trailer, which I don't even think he's going to use. Right. But he just wants it. Yeah. So, just Bob, to see if you'll get we're, it. We're going to try to get Air Bud done just as soon as Air Bud loses the ego. Mm. I hope that answered your question. And he also asks, uh, what's your favorite Hitchcock film? Oh, my God. Hmm. Oh, favorite That's... Hitchcock movie. Mm -hmm. That's hard because I... Uh... I would say it's it's really hard because um, Vertigo is one of my top like Rear favorite Window, movies. Vertigo. Rear Window is the one of those movies where you just watch it. It's just like it's cinematic magic. Yeah, yeah I'm a huge fan of Rear Window. So it's I don't know. It's hard because I, I I for me a lot of I think classic films uh, just it's nostalgia. Like because I remember like I'll still never forget the first time I watched Psycho and everyone's like oh Psycho it's overrated you know because everyone brings that up. But, Nobody who knows what they're talking it, about yeah. says Psycho's but, overrated I it's mean, ridiculous. For, for me I, don't, I, I, re I reject it. Yeah I find, I find myself though just really being inspired just by just so many films it can be a terrible film and there's always something good in there just a moment but I gotta say like I, I think for me nostalgically I really I really do like Psycho, but Rear Window, man, I think I have to go Rear Window. Mm. Rear, I, Rear Window's wonderful. The one thing I will say about Psycho that's actually a real thing, um, Psycho was one of those pivotal movies to me as a child because I remember I watched a double um, feature. It was uh, It's a Wonderful Life and Psycho. <laughs> that was the double feature? Yeah, and oh, I was a little kid, and I realized the spectrum of how wonderful movies could be because they're both two of my favorite movies. But to this day... Um, whenever I need to be inspired, I watch Psycho because Psycho is an entirely visual movie. Mm. It is so beautifully executed. But one of the scenes, and, and it's so, it amazes me, and I don't really hear people talk about it as much. It's that scene in the parlor with, with Norman and, and Marion. It's just talking, and it's so engaging, and the, and the, the camera setups, everything, it's just so perfect. And I think Anthony Perkins in that movie, I don't know yeah. how he didn't get an Oscar. Because that's such a beautifully nuanced performance. Like, it's so good. Right. And I remember just, like, seeing that for the first time. And, it, again, it's just two people talking. And that can go south pretty quick. Um, like... You know, like some some prequels a little bit. People like walking it, and talking. I feel Wait, like hold I changed. On a George Lucas is. <laughs> I'm I've, getting sued. I, I feel like change, I always change my favorites all the time though. It's like underwear day to day because like I get visual because I could go to the birds. I could go to like rope just from technically from things. You know, sure. I could a go. And notorious. That's yeah, a, notorious. That's a yeah. that's a terrific movie that no one really talks about as much. But I think it's because Hitchcock um, could only have. So many classics. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like Scorsese. It's like, what's your favorite Scorsese movie? There's like, like King of Comedy. Like you don't hear people talk about that as right. much. But I'm like, it's That's... just not talked about enough because he has too many classic, wonderful movies. Yeah, you know. It, yeah, it just gets lost in the shuffle sometimes. Yeah. Come on, people, ask questions. Well, and you know, on the other side of things, uh, what is your favorite Ernest film? <sighs> Scared Stupid. Fair. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I don't know if the yeah, that's gotta be. And the pantheon of Ernest movies. Right. Are, yeah. I mean <laughs> Yeah, you can't that's they're terrible, all right? great <laughs> in their own right. But yes. Scared stupid, I think, is the one that people go to the yeah, most. For sure. I think. What else we got there? Uh I don't know. We have uh Jess Mione, who we just had on the show recently. Oh, okay. Jess Mione um actually helped design um, these, the, if you see them around the Scranton Dunmore area, uh, mm -hmm. our, our posters with, uh, promoting the film, with all the flyers, she, yeah, she did all our wonderful flyers and she just, uh, did our tickets for us too, that people will get oh, at the nice. screening. So you guys are going to get some tickets if you show up. <laughs> so thanks Jess. You're we love always, you, Jess. thank you Jess so much. always <laughs> knocking it out of the park <laughs> in this area. So she asks, is there a certain subject matter you want to explore more in future films that you did not get to do in uh, The Burden of Beauty? Everything. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of a, a story that's somewhere in the back of my head about... Maybe the dangers of, of, of living in the past too long. You know, like these, like these things where like sometimes people are just like married to moments and it's kind of like how it can kind of affect your life, how it can hurt people in your life. Sure, yeah. And not just like embracing the present and how like, 
you know what I mean? I've, I've heard, a, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, I, you know, I watch a lot of nerd programming, uh, especially on, like, YouTube and stuff, and a lot of people have been talking recently, it seems, at least people that I watch anyway, about, like, kind of the danger of nostalgia and, like, how it's great that you can be nostalgic for things, but then you you, you leave yourself close to new things yeah. that could be just as good, it's even better. called Star better. Wars. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, Do you know what I mean? It takes over to the point where, you know, it, it, that's just the most important thing, and nobody else can kind of come in and do anything new, interesting, creative, yeah. whatever, and uh, you're just kind of a slave to how things were. The- Pass. When you were a That's kid. That's why characters are just what's going to... It's hard to say, because, like... I, what am I trying to say? So, with all, like, the superhero films right now, they are fun, so it's hard to say, like, oh, that, I don't want to see another one, but... Sure. It, I think right now, for us, anyway, the the modern... Uh, the approach we want to take is... You know, nostalgia is what drives us to the stories that we liked growing up as a kid. Those, like either horror films or good dramas or those uh, old school blockbusters, you know, that weren't just all in capes and, uh, and red underpants, you know, <laughs> but yeah. um, uh, granted, I, I love superhero films, but I think for us, it's like, it's those character driven pieces because why does it always have to be action or ass or, um, <laughs> you know, uh, like cameras that aren't grounded to anything? Why does sure. it have to be all this stuff when, you know, you can have a really awesome story uh, with characters that you can relate to and it just happens to maybe be a sci-fi backdrop or something else. Mm-hmm. Like, I think right now too much is be- being pushed to the forefront of, like, this effect or 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 maybe this, like you said to me earlier today, they gotta wear this t-shirt because that's a demographic or something. And I really think that, <laughs> yeah. you know, the Coke shirt. <laughs> it's just the, you know, it's the story and the characters. And I, I think for me, like, some of my favorite films are I'm just drawn to how these people make me feel because... Mm-hmm. If they can make me feel something, then they're doing their job, and that's just what I want to do. I'll give you an example in, in modern cinema that um, kind of goes along with what you're saying, like how it can actually be like damaging. Mm-hmm. I'm going to bring up a movie, and you may throw a chair at me. <laughs> it's in defense of this movie, but okay. um, I thought in The Last Jedi... <laughs> okay. Um, I loved the idea in that movie where like, like Kylo Ren... Mm. You're not a teacher. Um, or he's just like saying to her, like, okay, so the, the Jedi, the Sith, it's all the same thing. Just burn it down. Like you kind of have to kill the past to right. go forward. Mm. And I'm just like, oh, wow, like that's that's amazing. Like that's actually really cool because now Star Wars can grow. And they you know? absolutely did not do because that. Because <laughs> fandom, they were like, you are stepping on the toes of my childhood. Right. Because like this is not what I wanted. Hmm. Where I don't want to leave my childhood yet, and and trust me, I, I'm not like going at anybody about that. I get it. Like I, I love this stuff as much as anyone else does, but I was very excited because I'm not saying it's a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination. It has its hmm. issues, but I love that idea of just being like, you know, in order to go forward, you have to level the playing field now. You know, what I mean, it's right. just like let it go. Yeah. Let's, let's build something new. And I was like, cool. And then I saw Rise of Skywalker, and I think. Um, I vomited, you know, because I was yeah. just like, this was like JJ it, it did sh- too. He just all right all over the screen. Yeah, just, dude. Yeah. I think that should have been that should have been called like. Here's a whole shitload of ideas. <laughs> it shouldn't have just been called like. Throw them out. They're all bad. Here you go. They're <laughs> it's all like, at once. It should have been called like Star Wars: The Rise of Corporate Concerns. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, because it was just like, yeah. like, oh my god, we're losing Star Wars fans. I'm like, you are not. <laughs> They'll be back for the next one. <laughs> you know, just. Uh, Go work on your Boba Fett shirt. Yeah, I made that fine. joke to you the other day. It's like when Luke threw the lightsaber over his shoulder. I was like, "You lost me." I was. Yeah. I don't know. I just. I. I it was. A, it, yeah, it didn't work. But again, not a great film. Interesting ideas. Yeah. Right. Sprinkled throughout. And then, I, but I think that's the problem with the with with kind of going with what you're saying, like the 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 past nostalgia, how it can be damaging and letting things flourish. Right. Because right. now it's like Star Wars is just always going to be like. Yeah, like everything has to. Well, it, the it's, past, but worse. <laughs> very quick, weird side nerd tangent sort of thing. Uh, Please like, do. I'm a big. Uh, I, I, I grew up on all those, you know, properties Ghostbusters and Star Wars and Marvel and all that kind of stuff. Me too. And, you know, Turtles and, and whatever. 
And like uh, G.I. Joe is one of those ones that's like a, a great example of it trying to come back and they absolutely do not know what to do with that hmm. property yeah. at yeah. all. Uh, because you know you had the, the 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 dolls of the '60s and the '70s and stuff, and then they completely revamped it for the '80s and gave us you know Real American Hero with them fighting Cobra and that sort of stuff. That stuff wasn't in the original concept of GI Joe. He was always just the the, the soldier in, in war until you know that kind of became a little controversial. Like yeah, maybe we shouldn't be promoting war to kids and stuff like that. So then it became like let's make up a fake bad guy that's not in the real world that nobody can get offended by. And so they came up with Cobra and this whole big backstory and stuff. And then the, the, you know, the figure sold into like the nineties and then in the nineties, it kind of, you know, but uh, you know, the eighties was its big heyday in the nineties. It kind of started to flounder because then they started chasing trends and it was like, uh, uh, okay, uh, G.I. Joe goes to space, uh, <laughs> which is, of course, like the last, G. you know, Joe meets the Muppets, you, 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 the last <laughs> gasp of any, uh, uh, of any property that starts on Earth. Uh, just send them to space. That'll, that'll work. They tried it with He-Man. They, they did it with everything. Um, Leprechaun even, Jason. you know, went to space. <laughs> Jason, yeah. Every, everybody goes to space. Jason did but go like, to space. But like, they, 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 you know, threw everything at the wall. They uh, couldn't figure it out. So then it kind of just laid dormant for a while. Now they're reintroducing it as a six inch figure line because that's what's popular now. So you have G.I. Joe classified, and immediately they tried to make them kind of more modern looking, you know, give them pieces of armor and stuff they didn't have before, almost trying to play off of like modern video games and things like that. And immediately people are like, yeah, no, just give us exactly what we had in the 80s just in six inch scale. So that's what they're doing now. And then people are pissed like, well, then you're not going forward with anything. You're getting the old school fans who are like, yes, I want to just see the 80s recreated over again. But kids today are looking at that going, that's fucking lame. Like, that's stupid. Like, those look dumb. I'm not, I'm not going to get into those. So there's no future generation to actually carry it on. Then they obviously they try to do movies and stuff, too. And same thing. They're trying to modernize this stuff that was very cheesy in 80s of its own. Like, you watch G.I. Joe, and it's very cheesy in <laughs> 80s. So you, you try to modernize that, and people are going... Wait, there's ninjas in this, and there's like, because ninjas were cool in that time. Now it's like, why are they military, but there's ninjas, and there's this, and there's that? This makes because no Because shut up, that's makes why. Absolutely <laughs> no sense. You know, they uh, you know, terrible Hollywood script writers, you know, trying to, uh, you know, pump out these movies. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a weird thing, but it's a good example of what we're talking about overall. Yeah. We're hanging on to that nostalgia. And I'm one of those guys. I'd kind of rather just see that sort of stuff that reminds me of that. But I ha also acknowledge that, like, no kid today is going to give up living shit about G.I. Joe. Do you know Joe. what they should really pay attention to yeah. is the success of Top Gun Maverick. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you see that? Yeah, it was really well it's done. terrific. And, and it's like literally it feels like what I always wanted to see a, 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 like a, a way down the road sequel do. Right. Which is feel like it belongs in that world hmm. and take the spirit of the film but do a little modern spin on it. Sure. And it's so perfectly executed. Like like my girlfriend and I, we were watching it and we were both just like, this movie kind of rocks, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I was expecting it. I was expecting it to just be like, you know, Halloween 2018 <laughs> where you're just kind of like, I get what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. But stop it. Yeah. <laughs> no, the Easter eggs were yeah. really nice in that film, too. They yeah, weren't just too yeah. much in your face. They were just laid out really nice. But when you, um, but real quick, that you brought up the turtles, and I, like, <laughs> I have to go to the turtles. <laughs> to go back to them. It's, again, you asked me in the beginning, like, oh, my films that get me into it, but it's like their first Ninja Turtles movie. Oh, like, it's just so good. So good. So awesome. Yeah. How gritty it is, how dark the story is, and it's just that. Because it was an indie film. Yeah. It was uh, the highest grossing independent film at the time. The early and, days of New Line Cinema. Yeah. Yeah, when they took chances and, yeah. like, you know, gave <laughs> it a little Shay, bit of an edge like... and stuff, and then immediately went back on that with the second movie. <laughs> well, yeah, that's when they started hitting each other with hot dogs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, Come on, kids, my... you don't have to use sticks to hit each other. <laughs> but that was my thing why I, I said I started realizing I got really drawn into a lot of visuals, too, and like a style, mm. because, you know, even early on, 
I always was gravitated towards the first one. You would think that for me, being as playful and ADD and crazy as I was, <laughs> that the second <laughs> one or the third one yeah. uh, would be for me. But I just really liked that first one. And, and uh, even E.T., I don't even know how I didn't bring that up because I have E.T. tattooed on my arm. But, like, um, even that, like, as even as a kid coming from, a, you know, a family where my mom had to, like, just be the mom, the dad, the everything, you know, mm. that, that story about a broken family, but then there's an alien and stuff. So with Jess's question, there's like, there's so many things that I want to do and Rory wants to do. And I have like, I couldn't even begin to explain the like 30 ideas I have, uh, it, you know, that have titles and this and that. It's just, and one that has broken families and, and, a, and an alien or a monster, you know, but there's just so much to, to do and there's just not enough time to say them all. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I had to bring up that Ninja Turtles because I don't know how I <laughs> left that and ET and everything else off. But all right, well, we got to wrap up. But real quick, uh, we have uh, Camille asked uh, two quick questions. Uh, would Would you want to get the film made on a disc? So like you know DVDs, oh, Blu-rays, sure. that sort of thing. You yeah, want, I want to see Blu-ray go with the poster for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, because that that's another one of those things like. Uh, Anything that we make off this film, you know, you'd think it would just be like, okay, so I just bought like a like a like a bunch of splitters and like you know, yeah. HDMI cords. You'd think I'd be using that to like some of the money to make up for that <laughs> loss, but it was just like everything goes to the next film. So anything that we can, you know, but yeah, yeah, can yeah. we want to do that? And uh, do you have any plans to make a horror film? Who's that from? Same, Camille. Same. Oh, um, I have something that's uh that i finished it's not like i'm never gonna make a horror film the way that um i think some people might want you to make a horror film which is kind of like rinse and reuse you know right i i i i did something because we were talking about at one point about doing like a like an anthology film and i think it's the coolest thing that i've written so far like when i read it i'm just like oh like this is something it's a it's definitely in tone of a horror film, but it's okay. it's just like everything else I do, where it's just about the characters and stuff, you know. So yeah, Camille, thanks for asking me questions, Lemons. <laughs> so uh, let's plug the uh, actual event here. The Burden of Beauty debuts at uh, Three Jacks Burger Bar in Dunmore on Wednesday, August seventeenth, eight p.m. $10 admission uh, includes uh, popcorn and soda or a draft beer. Uh, food, drinks, and limited edition cocktails will be available for purchase. Uh, anything else you want to say about that event? Now, you, I'm assuming you guys are going to be there. Are you going to be what? able to answer people's questions or anything? Are you guys doing any of that kind of aspect of it? We're going to do that. Um, you're going to see me there um, sporting a look to one of the most important movies ever. <laughs> Ed Wood. Yes, you know. So um, you're gonna look just like Edward. I'm gonna look just like him, you know. Anyway, I'm more um, body condom. No, but I will say <laughs> to to explain the to give more uh, of a solid answer to your question is, um, yeah, we want to bring everyone I didn't in. Answer your question yeah. at all. Uh, we're gonna have like an hour where everyone comes in, can put in orders and hang out. And if they want to ask us questions or, or talk to us, we'll be floating around, and then so they can get a chance to get their food before we you know start the show where we're trying to gather right now like uh independent trailers and stuff because we really want to push as much local stuff as possible so we're going to have some trailers and uh a, a surprise additional short film hopefully and a message from rory and i before the film so and also if anybody out there right now does have a trailer that you want to put before our film um this is a really important thing for us yeah we really want to help promote your work yeah. like we want to be able to like assist you because we understand the importance of getting your stuff out there mm -hmm. and being able to have a, anywhere to just show it that's not just the internet right sure um send it to us, um, send us go to the trailers, raven please. view productions um at gmail.com um and just send it to me and we will put your work up on the screen to help you out um Fun thing at the show, we're gonna have a, a big giant popcorn machine. Oh, nice! Yeah, we're gonna make some popcorn. <laughs> um, my 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 girlfriend. You're um, gonna she, burst out of it. Yeah, <laughs> naked. Um, my 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 my, uh, my girlfriend uh, Becca Melian, she bought it for me for my birthday, and I think we can agree on this. She was the MVP of our production. Yeah, she was, was the executive producer MVP. 
everything. You know? <laughs> I, I know you're like, I, I know your, your wife. Yep. Um, it, there's something about having somebody just like in have your, your corner. back. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Cause honestly, like I, I always, I, I told her this a bunch of times. I don't know if she believes me or not, but, um, now it's on film. So totally is true. Right. Um, you know, Raven view productions, burden of beauty, all of it. Like, you know, it, it doesn't happen if you have somebody who's just like, you know, you're going to fail, right? Like, you know, Dewey <laughs> Cox's girlfriend? <laughs> Never going to make it, Dewey. <laughs> I got a gold record at 14. I think I'm doing just fine. Um, so, yeah, so she, she she got me a popcorn machine for my birthday, which is possibly the coolest present anyone's ever going to buy me. So, um, and, uh, oh, and also one little quick thing. Can I just throw something in here? Sure. So, um, while we were filming, we did have a makeup artist, um, Lauren Egbert, and she just opened up a salon called Little Shop of Hairdos. I knew the name of it, but I still looked at this just because <laughs> I sure. doubted myself. Yeah, but yeah, so she she did. Uh, she, if if you watch the film and you look at everybody and you say they look great, hmm. that was an that Egbert. was all her. Yeah, so so yeah, go watch the movie, guys. What are you sitting here for? Uh, how long is this film? Um, it's about. It's gonna be about like fifteen ish minutes. Okay. Um, and then there's some other. Yeah, we're, we're having another little short. Uh, we're hoping just to have hit the hit, cross the finish line with that one too for it, and okay. then um, uh, a, a video message from us. We're hoping to have like at least like close to 25, 30 minutes of like solid watchable stuff for this first little Raven viewing party. We're calling it because as ah, I see what you did as, there. Yeah, as we do more, it's all him. <laughs> this pun. As we as there's we, a pun, I'll make it. <laughs> As as we get excited, as we grow and get further along, we'll have more content to show. There's we're, a pun I'm gonna make. <laughs> we're hoping to also be able to, you know, like we were saying before, not only with trailers, but eventually get enough stuff to have our own little events too, where we have more independent films to show that aren't just ours. But oh, nice. you know, we always just want to keep growing the viewing party, kind of make it a little tradition, and be able to have as many of our short show and features, you know, hopefully. So keep supporting us, everybody, so we can get there. Um, I really don't want to have a regular day job anymore. Uh, but like that's, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. And also with um, this, this showing, definitely, definitely do yourself a favor and order something off the menu. Because I, I don't know if anyone at home has been to Three Jacks before, but uh, John Reckless is some kind of culinary wizard. And um, I'm not like a big fried food fan, mm. you know. Um, I don't go out of my way to eat a lot of it, but his menu is a is a rabbit hole of sorts <laughs> so do yourself a favor and get something like and that. they obviously support yeah. local artists so we need to support them so. <laughs> there would Absolutely. literally have been no we, anything yeah. there's no raven view there's Without no their film, pity. there's no nothing we thank you guys so much he's just I mean, like i'm so worried about you just make your movie yeah. here take my keys no but i, 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 I thank you too though man for bringing us out here and yeah of course questions and letting us get this message out to the people. Like, you know, we got to show you love too, man. Like what you do for this area. And you said it before we started and I've been wanting to say something to you about it is you were like, oh, you know, I got to the music scene and the Scranton has to have music too, right? Our culture here in the Electric City with like uh, artists and musicians and stuff, it's like, it just doesn't get the light, man. And you're out there to shine it on there. Cause I always say like the culture here is more than what I think a lot of people understand that we have and absolutely and you're that outlet for everyone to be able to do that so yeah you like you do this stuff and it's like like you make this area fun and like the same thing with like 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 jess mione and bob keller like you guys are just like this is probably a really good way to put that name name shining yeah but i mean it's just it's neat because there's so many people in the world that are just like like ah everything sucks yeah, no, it's true. You know, and they're just oh, that's sucks. yeah, it's, 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 it's like, cool. You like, suck, okay, like <laughs> all right, there's cool stuff here. We're here, he's here, everyone's here. I give it up to anybody who just like you know, puts the money where the mouth is. You know, just yeah. like get up and, and and put some positive change into the world. And 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 it, it was almost it was so much fun just talking to you like this. Like it was such a yeah. great time. And 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 you had to listen to us babble like a couple <laughs> of like coffee addled yeah. weirdos, but. No, I, yeah, thank you for the opportunity yeah, just man. to sit here and shoot the shit. Of course, yeah. So uh, so this will be the first uh, time people see this film. Mm-hmm. And uh, you guys are submitting to some, some film festivals, too, so this might uh, you know reach uh, other audiences as well. Yeah, can I tell you a quick thing before we leave? Yeah. Um, about Kevin Smith? Because mm. I so can. He, so he has a uh, uh, film festival. Mm-hmm. This fella here. 
Um, uh, another thing that you and I used to go on about are of course, Kevin yeah. Smith movies. <laughs> um, but yeah, literally we got everything finished um, and, and he brought it over and he's like, hey, I got the, the Foley all synced up. Tell me how I feel about it. So um, I watch it. Everything looks good. We like tweaked a couple little things here and there. Hmm. And then we're like basically signed off on it. 20 minutes later, we're like, Let's submit it to Kevin Smith's film festival. We're all like Kevin Smith geeks. Um, but weird story, about a year ago, um, <laughs> I was in uh, New Jersey. Um, my, my girlfriend and I, we were just literally going to go to um, the quick stop, and then we were going to just go to the beach. It was kind of like a one for me, one for you kind of thing. <laughs> sure. And uh, so we're like, oh, and the secret stash is there. We should go check out the secret stash too. That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we, we get there and there's this huge line going out the door and we're just like, oh, it's probably because of COVID, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, we can only have like two people inside. Uh, right, right, right. So I walk up and I have like a Brody moment where like <laughs> I get up there and I'm like, I'm like, oh, what's going on with the lines? You're like, like Kevin Smith's in there signing comics. And I'm like, <laughs> like, Kevin Smith's in there? And then I was kind of like a rat trying to find my way in. You know, I was just kind of like, I'm like, can I get in there? So we go up to the door and they're like, oh yeah, I was like, they were selling tickets online. So it's kind of uh -huh. like, so I'm like, that sucks. And then poof, right out the door comes Kevin Smith and he's just like standing in front of me. And I'm just like, <laughs> you know? So yeah. we ended up getting not able to go in and do that thing, but we, we did end up getting tickets to go to one of his like smod castle shows at the, oh, at cool. the actual quick stop yeah and um just get to the point of this whole thing <laughs> um <laughs> we're doing like the they do like a little q a during it so i took that as a shameless moment to mm. take out my card <laughs> <laughs> get it up to him because i was basically saying i'm like you know I, I never wanted to make like a kevin smith movie per se mm. but he was one of those like filmmakers that when i would listen to his characters talk they were so engaging like nothing had to happen in the movie but you were sure. invested in the movie mm -hmm. so like that was always a thing where i'm like if you're gonna write dialogue make it like interesting it doesn't just have to be like a get into this room into the next room kind of thing like let's leave right now yeah. um it was always just kind of like wow this guy's just has like such a like a strong grasp on who these people are mm -hmm. so it was really important to me so i just wanted to just kind of give him like a moment where i was like dude like thank you so much for just like you know, inspiring me as a 13 year old kid who probably shouldn't have been watching what you were putting out there. <laughs> and uh, he took the, he took the card and he's just like, like, I'm going to keep this in my wallet forever. And then I'm going to plant it on a crime scene. <laughs> 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 Go out with a laugh. <laughs> That's funny. He's very good at that. Yeah. He's, am he's, he's, he's amazing. <laughs> I, the first time I, I met him was at uh, Bloomsburg university. Was, really? You met him? It was before dogma came out. <laughs> like we're talking that it's long amazing. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my dad was actually a fan uh, and had, sh you know, I had seen, uh, you know, Clerks and uh, Mallrats, I think, at that point. And Amy, yeah, I think I'd seen the the first three. And then uh, they were starting the production on Dogma and talking about it and stuff like that. So that's when uh, I got to meet him, like really early on. And it was like a theater that was, I don't, it probably wasn't even half full. Like, really? Yeah, yeah, because he wasn't that. Like, he wasn't the 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 nerd guy that everybody interviews today, or that you know does all the interviews today, or has you know a million podcasts and things like that. So like, uh, so that was yeah, that was a cool experience. And then I've I've met him since then too. But it's you know the, the line would get longer and longer every <laughs> yeah. time. So he's interesting to listen to. Rare. I always like those evening when Kevin Smith things. Like he's just a guy. For that sure. Can do yeah. So much. I, Superman. You know, story. people say about his movies and stuff nowadays versus those and whatever. But you know, at the end of the day, I just see him as like, yeah, he's a cool, he's a cool dude. He did a lot of good shit. And what are uh, they saying though? They're like. All he did was clerks, oh, mall rats, chasing Amy, <laughs> dog, yeah, mother, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. leave right, him alone. Like, <laughs> like, you, like most filmmakers are lucky to get even one watchable movie out. No, but right, I think that's, right. like, that's alone. the moral yeah. to this whole story. Like we all say that we want to do it, so just do it. Like mm. literally, he did it. He Absolutely. built it on his own. That's what we're trying to do. You know, you guys, if you want to do it too, just do it. All right, so or don't make sure you go see uh, the Burden of Beauty at Three Jacks Burger Bar in Dunmore uh, next Wednesday, August seventeenth, eight p.m. Uh, Ten dollars admission. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I will say, unsolicited, uh, the burgers are incredible. <laughs> it's, 
definitely the best in the area easily. So, uh, you know, make sure you go out and, uh, you know, support a, uh, a local bar that supports the local arts as well as uh, some local filmmakers who are trying to make things happen around here. So if you like the show, you enjoy this, you had fun with the conversation, make sure you like, comment, share, all that good stuff. Uh, you know, help us uh, uh, break through the algorithm and, uh, you know, connect with other nerds who uh, want to hear us babble on about uh, film for, for two hours and then, like, uh, like ten minutes of weird G.I. Joe talk in there somewhere, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, and a few minutes of Star Wars, too. I think we, we squeezed Wars. just enough Star Wars. There was no way that. this was going to happen without us yeah, 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 talking about Star Wars at some point. Of course. But, uh, yeah, so thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll uh, roll the trailer again uh, at the end of the show, so uh, stay tuned for that, and uh, we will see you here next Wednesday. Have a good night. Open your eyes, what can you see around? A girl who looks like that is never lonely. She's just like you, kid. Only, the much prettier face. Hold in your breath still. You jump the fire. Well, just sit and wait till. Kira? Open your eyes. What can you see around?